The Bible stands, though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand. When the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on its firm foundation, for the Bible stands. Acts chapter 21. I'm reading from the King James Version. Won't you follow along in the text before you? And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course to Kos. That's pronounced long O, not an U. Kos. And the day followed unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, um, we spell it a little bit differently now than what they did back then. We went aboard and set forth. Now when we had discovered Cyprus and left it on the left hand and sailed into Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlaid her burden. Finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and we went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children. Still we were out of the city. Till we were out of the city, we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we took ship and they returned home again. I'm going to break right there. Um, and let's just have a, a moment of prayer, giving you the opportunity to confess all known sin before God the Father, and then ask that God might teach you. This is done in the secrecy of silent prayer. Father, what a joy it is to open up your word and to find understanding and to do so with brothers in Christ who love you and encourage us to step forth and grow in, in your grace through the study of your word. We give you praise and thanks. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity afforded to us. Fill us, I pray, with the Spirit, and I pray that your word might find a home in our hearts. And in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. The passage of Scripture that we're going to be going into actually is a powerful passage. Probably you've never even heard a sermon on it, but it's a powerful passage when you come to consider the situation. Is God all-powerful? He can do whatever He wants, however He wants. Or is He shackled in some areas? And is God all-knowing? Does He know just the things that He's experienced? Or does He know future events? Does, does God's knowledge encompass both past, present, and all the way into eternity? Okay. The way you answer that will be the way that you will treat God and the way that you will respond to Him. And in this passage, we see Paul doing things that some theologues come along and say, he was sinning. He was in disobedience to the will of God. He was going in a contrary direction from God. And others will say, no, this was God's perfect plan. We marvel that Paul did what he did, but it is in fulfillment of God's plan. God has a plan, a perfect plan. And is he dependent upon the effectual use of that plan by your whims, by your decisions. Can you stand in the way of what God has intended for your life? Now you're starting to think this one through, aren't you? Because some people, because some people say, oh, but I can go contrary to God's will. I can do something that isn't right. I can mess up God's plan altogether. Ah, 
then who between the two of you is all powerful? If you say you can mess up God's plan, if you say your own willfulness, your own sinfulness, your own foolishness can thwart the perfect plan of God for your life, that you would surprise him somewhere along the line by doing something that he goes, oh, oh I wasn't thinking about that one. Who is he? And when we look at this, we're going to be we're going to be saying, is Paul doing that which is according to God's holy plan? Or is Paul doing something according to his own will at that moment? Can Paul thwart God's plan for Paul? Now that's a pretty big question. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, but understand. I'm not preaching a sermon, okay? We are looking at this passage of Scripture, primarily um, chapter 21 through the first um, 26 verses. We're in the area of third missionary journey. If your notes say something other than a capital E there, I was putting it up there incorrectly, and I recognized what I was doing and caught myself. It should be an E and... Um, for the third missionary journey and that is chapter 18 verse 23 through the 14th verse of this chapter we're reading and the fourth and final point was the journey home and we've been looking at the journey home um, and that ends in verse 14 again we saw the address at Miletus this has already been done that was the last time we got together um, Paul talking to the elders of the church at Ephesus. I say church at Ephesus with the full realization that after three years of Paul's ministry in Ephesus, there were several churches in Ephesus and around that town in villages around. So the churches from Ephesus sent there uh, by, by order were sent their um, elders down to Miletus on the coast and met with Paul for one last time. We looked at that and that tearful um, exit that uh, Paul had to take in uh, verse 38. Now we're starting the trip to Caesarea, um, verses 1 through 14. Verses 1 through 14. You know, it wasn't easy for Paul to leave the Ephesian elders. They were very very close. After three years of ministry, they could, they could pretty much anticipate what the other person was going to do. It was a deep uh, bond of love. The Greek word translated here in verse 1, and in verse chapter 21, verse 1, and it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came straight course to Kos, and the day followed unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Batara. Um, he, he gives this, and we had gotten from them. That uh, word gotten, translated, <laughs> we're gotten in our text, is the uh, Greek word apospao. Apospao. And uh, apospao means, this is apo way spao, to be dragged, <laughs> to be heavily dragged. Um, so apostao means to be dragged, pulled, forced. The verb implies a great force was required. But the, the um, lightest use of this term, apostao, is in the Greek, they use it in reference to the drawing of a sword out of the sheath. And they use that as apostao. But there's a little bit of care that's taken. That sword is just so long, and you know, and your arm is just so long. 
And so there, I guess to some people that's a difficult dragging situation. But usually when that word is used, great force is needed in, in that situation. Um, so how would I translate this? Well, Paul had to tear himself away from the Ephesian elders. So great was Paul's love for the Ephesians. Uh, if you have a, had the map, um, you remember where these puppies came from in my bag? If you could grab one out and hand it to Gent in the back. If you take out your life of the Apostle Paul and turn to page 8, turn to page 8, page 8, you see the, the map um, there at the top. And you see him at Miletus, right in the center of that map on what would be the coast of Turkey, Asia in this map. Um, you see Miletus, and then you see the ship going to Kos, which is C-O-S in, in our language, K in, uh, um, in the Greek, um, K-O-S. And then from there, um, he takes it around and hits the top corner of Rhodes. The island of Rhodes looks very much like a spearhead. And the town of Rhodes is right on the northernmost part of that island of Rhodes. Rhodes is Greek for the word rose, the flower, the rose. Um, and then he went from Rhodes and he went up to Patara on the coast under that word Lydia there. And what we're going to be talking about um, this evening, you'll see as numbers 6, 7, and 8 in your listing of the third missionary journey, if you'd like to follow along. He and his party sailed from Miletus to Kos. Then they hopped another boat, or the boat then continued on to Rhodes, and then on to Patara. It was a three-day journey to make it to Patara from where he was. But Paul, as best we can tell, was uncomfortable with the local coastal ship that was stopping at every port along the way. Got it? And so, when he found the boat going directly to Phoenicia, he and his friends boarded it. He and his friends. Keep in mind, we've already talked about who was with Paul at this time. He had several people from um, Macedonia and from Greece who were taking gifts, uh, financial gifts, to the church at Jerusalem because they were going through a very severe famine and the money could buy some food for these starving families. So he had those guys with him and he also had his regular companions who, we realize, um, primary in that was Luke himself. Thus, as we read through these, this text, it says, and we went here, and we did this, and we did that. Verse 1, it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came to the straight course to Kos, and the day followed unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara. That was three days. And finding a ship, sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. The trip from where they are right now in Patara all the way to Phoenicia where they went to um, was a voyage of about 400 miles that he took um, by direct sea route. Then look at verses 3 and 4. Now when we had discovered Cyprus, okay, they weren't the explorers. All right. When we had seen Cyprus, we passed it, and it was on our left, is what he's, what he's saying. And so as you look at your map, you'll see they went south under the island of Cyprus. We left it on the left hand and sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unlade her burden. 
Verse 4, finding disciples in Tyre, we tarried there seven days. One commentator that I had was really good. He, he made comment. He said, ooh, you know what I think? I think he didn't know much about the church at Tyre, that he'd never visited there. We have no record that he had gone to Tyre prior to this. For him to, and for them to use the word finding, this is a word, after great search, one comes upon. So it implied that it wasn't easy for him to find the church at um, Tyre, but he looked around until he could find the disciples. Then Paul, and then uh, Luke goes on, we tarried there, stayed there seven days, who said to Paul, through the Spirit, who said to what? In the Greek, it's a little clear. The who goes to the disciples. The disciples at the church in Tyre um, said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. So, going south, Cyprus lands at Tyre. The ship was unloading cargo and he searches for the church and finds them. Stays with that church for a week, which is an obvious um, indication to us that it took a week to unload the cargo of that, of that large ship and to put on new cargo for them to go on down the coast. The persecution of the early church in Jerusalem had scattered a group of believers to Phoenicia. In uh, chapter 11, if you remember, and uh, verse 19, chapter 11, verse 19, we read, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but to the Jews only. Ah, that opens up some more information, doesn't it? in regards to our brothers there in Tyre. They came originally, they, they grew up, they went to high school in Jerusalem, all right? These are Jerusalem people, believers in Jesus Christ, who fled the city of Jerusalem under the persecution that Herod put against them, and they fled to the city of Tyre. And they ministered to who? To the Jews only. For to them, the faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, Messiah of Israel, they felt was only a, a message that would go to God's people, Israel. And so they were sharing there in the synagogue. Probably many came to know Christ as Lord and Savior because of their ministry. But that lets us know a little bit about this church there in Tyre. Um, through the Spirit, the Bible tells us, the believers at Tyre urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. In view of that phrase, through the Spirit, through the agency of the Spirit, I ask you, keeping in mind, was Paul wrong in pursuing a course to go to Jerusalem? Paul felt that he was to go to Jerusalem. He's expressed this already in both of his letters and what Luke has told us about his plans here. His plan is Jerusalem, Rome, and then Spain. That is Paul's plan. He's, he's got this thing worked out in his head. But the first step of it is to go back to Jerusalem. Why? Why does it got to go back to Jerusalem? We're going to say this on several occasions, so I hope it sticks. He's got to go back to Jerusalem because he and these guys who are with him are carrying a lot of cash that they are going to give to the church at Jerusalem. This is a mission. He's got a plan. He's going to Jerusalem. They said, oh, no. If you go there, serious, the Spirit has told us if you go there, you are going to have a difficult time. You see that in verse 4? through the Spirit, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Um, 
there's guys that are uh, that are on both sides of this. Some that say, Paul, what are you doing? Why don't you listen to people? And there's others that are saying, no, look at the situation. Look at the scripture as to, uh, in regards to this. If you got limber Bibles, hope you do. Turn with me to, to chapter 20, verse 22. It's just back a page or so. Chapter 20, verse 22. And now behold, I go, says Paul, bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things which shall befall me there. I'm going. The Spirit has me compelled. I'm going to Jerusalem. Look in, in this chapter, in verse uh, 14. Go on ahead in chapter 21 to verse 14. When he would, Paul, would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, uh, we ceased and saying, the will of the Lord be done. Um, compare that with uh, chapter 19, verse 21. 19, 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had uh, passed through Macedonia, Achaia, and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, Jerusalem, I must also see Rome. These verses imply that Paul was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was God's own will that he continue on to Jerusalem. Don't go! Yeah, I'm going. Um, also, verse uh, chapter 23. Go on ahead. Chapter 23, verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Now this is the Lord speaking. Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. I'm going to Jerusalem, then I'm going to Rome. Why? The Spirit constrains me. This is what I believe the Lord wants me to do. And the Lord, later on, you see, is saying, okay, you've, in the same way that you've borne the Spirit, the same way you have evangelized in Jerusalem, you'll do so in the city of Rome. The comfort that God himself gives to Paul. Um, this is obviously not Paul stubbornly refusing to do God's will. And then in verse uh, chapter 23, verse 1, 23 and verse 1, Paul earnestly, beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I've lived all in good conscience before God until this day. Oh, did you catch it? I believe what I have done, bear, I'm bearing witness. This is God's plan. I have a quietness of conscience. I'm not disturbed by this. I'm not wondering if I had done the right thing or not. I'm convinced that this is God's plan for me. And then fourth and finally, maybe the Spirit is just asking because this is through the Spirit, right? Maybe this is the Spirit just asking Paul, can you trust me? You know what you're supposed to do. And these people say, God's Spirit has said, I sh you're not supposed to do it. Simply, can you trust me? I think that's basically what we're seeing. Those words, through the Spirit, in verse 4, could just mean that the Spirit had revealed to the church that Paul is going to suffer in Jerusalem. And listen to me. He did suffer in Jerusalem. He was imprisoned. That's why this whole, the aim that we're going to is the imprisonment uh, in Judea when we get to um, verse 15. Therefore, they're frightened. <laughs> they're worried. Oh, I'm just really concerned, actually. I, I'm, I, I'm not, you know, I'm just, I'm not worried. I'm concerned. You've heard people say that kind of rubbish. Tell me if this is a good motivation. Fear and worry.
This ain't disappointment. This is, ah! this isn't, I haven't gone, I've gone there and it ain't working. This is, oh no, if I go there, I'm toast. Fear. Worry. For three long years, the United States of America, one of the most powerful nations in this world, what has been their motivation? Fear. Worry. You need to, you need to, when does the government ever tell you you need to in regards to your health? Come tax time. Come tax time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very timely. Thank you. <laughs> so understand, this was what their motivator was upon Paul. Scare him. Make him worry. Then maybe you can turn him from doing what God willed him to do. Well, look at that in verse 5. Oh, my soul. Um, chapter 21, verse 5. And when we had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way. And they all brought us on our way with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we kneeled down on the shore and we prayed. Verse 6. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we took ship and they returned home again. This was Paul's first contact, as best we know, his first contact with the church in Tyre. And yet after only one week with them, they had strong bonds of love. They couldn't see him go out to the boat by himself. They had to accompany, accompany him. With their wives and kids, they accompanied him out to the boat and they knelt on the shore and prayed together. The departure scene is not as, as poignant as the one we studied back in Miletus on chapter 20 and verse 37, but it is still very emotional. Look at verse 7. And when we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus and saluted the brethren and abode with them one day. Um, Ptolemaeus. He said, there it is. Um, Ptolemaeus is known to you as Acre, or if you look at a modern um, map of Israel today, um, they'll probably go Akko. This city was called Akko from its inception. Uh, the Jews tell us that is the combo word that. It's uh, right here, or stop here, is, is what the word means. And they said that when God was, was, bringing in the ocean, was making the oceans and was coming up higher and higher and higher, that, that the prayer was, Akko, right? Stop here. And he stopped there. And that's the name. Uh, I think there's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek with that one. I'm not quite sure. But... During the Greek time, when the Ptolemies were ruling this part of the Middle, uh, Middle East, um, uh, Emperor Ptolemy, with great humility, named this place Ptolemaeus after himself. Very, very humble man, I'm sure. And it held that name uh, until roughly about the time that the, the Arabs moved, uh, the Muslims moved into that area. Um, the ship proceeds the, that 20 miles down to Ptolemaeus at Modern Acre um, for a one day stop it's believed that the church there uh, um, it's believed that the church there began at the exact same time as the church in Tyre in that when you read that passage again in regards to the, the the scattering, they mention that they went to Phoenicia and such. And so the church that was in um, Acre, in Ptolemais, was also um, people from Jerusalem, Jews who believed in the Messiah um, and Jesus. 
In verse 8, we read, And the next day that uh, where Paul's company departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and we abode with him. Verse 9, And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. The 40-mile trip on to Caesarea, um, Paul, uh, Luke doesn't tell us if they hoofed it, rode in a wagon, or hopped a, hopped a boat. Um, my own personal feeling is, is I think they went by sea because Paul is hurrying back to Jerusalem. He's in a rush, and so I don't think he would have would have uh, made that a hike. It would have been a couple day hike. Um, I think he would have rather taken the ship, a ship to a seaport, Caesarea, which was very accommodating. It was a big seaport, so they could get easy uh, transportation there. Paul's host there in Caesarea was Philip the Evangelist. He was one of the seven original deacons. We studied about him in chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, where the deacons were called. He was one of those. Um, remember what the situation was? The church was um, a little bit split on the subject of the Jewish um, believers and the Jewish believers that had picked up culture of the, of the Greeks, Hellenizers, they were referred to this two different area, the, those that had um, kind of stepped away from the old traditions of the Torah and had gone into some of the more modern thinking, um, though they were believers in Jesus Christ, they felt that they were being treated differently than those, their women were being treated differently, widows, than the widows of, of the Jewish folks. And so to settle that, the apostles just said, okay, we're not going to hand out the food. We're not going to hand out the, the um, needs for these ladies. We're going to get servants. Um, the seven were deacons. We're in the process right now of choosing some more deacons. Do you know what this word deacon means? Servant? <laughs> Servant. Servant. Diaconus. Servant. Listen to me. Why in tarnation didn't they translate it and just simply say servants? Wouldn't that have been easy? The reason? Very, very political. Understand the Anglicans who translated this text for us had a position within their church that was called deacon. It was like a board of elders. It was a, a people of power within the Anglican church. And so, to just take the word diaconus and translate it what it is, servant, you would look at these guys, wealthy churchmen, making quite a living for being a deacon, and it would look kind of funny. So they didn't translate it. They just transliterated it into our language and it comes in as deacon. It's simply the word servant. So what should a deacon mean? A servant, one who serves other believers, one who meets the needs of those around him. And Philip was such a man. If he saw need, he immediately went to, to meet that need. He ministered to the widows in Jerusalem. And then remember, he went on an evangelistic crusade, which took him all the way down to the coast, where he met a very wealthy man, a man of influence, a treasurer um, for the queen of Ethiopia. This man was in a chariot riding along, and he was reading from the scrolls in Hebrew out loud. Philip could hear him reading the scriptures, stepped up, says, you know what you're, what you're reading? He said, how can I? And let somebody explain it. So Philip explained it. And that Ethiopian treasurer trusted in Christ as Lord and says, there's water right here. What, 
prevents me from being baptized. And he was baptized in his face. And then Philip went north. The Bible tells us he disappeared from there. And he went up to Caesarea and began ministering there. Philip is still in Caesarea with his family, ministering in the church at Caesarea. Um, he's been there roughly 20 years now, living in that one town. And it was, a, it was the most, Ro how do I say this, Romanized um, city in Judea. It was just a little bit of Rome transferred to the coast of Judea. He was living there, sharing with folks. And the Bible tells us he had, had uh, four unmarried daughters. Parthenoi is the word. Parthenoi in the Greek means an unmarried daughter and usually involves immediately that she is a virgin, that she has not known any man. These four daughters, none of them been married, each, the Bible tells us here, had the gift of prophecy. The spiritual gift evident in the early church, curiously, was not limited to men. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Some gifts are limited to men. But this one we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even as one as if she was shaven. Prophesied. Praying and prophesying. Pretty powerful. By the way, this text is pretty powerful. It doesn't preach very well in the year 2021. Um, it's very awkward to preach. None of you have hats on. Oops. None of you would have hats on because it says that I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, says Paul, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man it's Jesus Christ. And the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God the Father. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Who does he bring dishonor on? According to that passage, I'll read it again. Every man, I know it's awkward, but this is God's word and it's eternal and we can live with that which is eternal. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Who's his head? Said in verse 3. Who is the head? Christ. Christ, Christ Jesus is our head. No. Who's his head? The Father. We are answerable, and we bring dishonor upon the Lord if, we, if I was up here teaching with a hat on. I would be dishonoring Christ, according to this passage. But every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even as if she were shaven. Whores had their heads shaven. Um, they did that at the end of World War II as well, to identify this woman has been caught in prostitution. This woman has been used. She is wrong. Shave her head. He said, it's the same as if this woman was shorn. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn, oh yeah, and shaven, oh boy, let her be covered. Wear a head covering. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Do you see? This is not a cultural matter. Do you see? This is not a cultural matter. 
this is a scriptural, biblical matter that we have treated very lightly um, in our generation. Our previous generations, my grandmother, I never saw her at church without a head covering. Never. Nor the other ladies in church. In the 50s, they all had head coverings. But then in the 60s, the hair bouffants. Uh My mother said, looks ridiculous. Off came my mother's head covering in the 1960s, and it never went back on. And our culture, as a God-fearing people with the Bible in our hands, have turned away from that which is clearly taught in the Word to doing what is comfortable, convenient, and now cultural. Well, he had four women, and they had the gift of prophecy. That word prophecy, prophet. That word prophet, um, the pro, in the beginning of it, the pro means before or prior, you can say. And the, the Greek word you might not see here, phimi, the word phimi um, is to show something, to cast a light upon something, to make something fully known. Because the word for light is phos, phosphorescent. <laughs> you know these, these kind of words. Phos is simply the word light in the Greek language. And so this is beforehand putting a light on it, beforehand making it known. That's what the gift of prophecy is. Verse 10 we read, And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. When he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, and he bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, this belt, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Agabus, a prophet. We've already met this guy. In chapter 11 and verse 28, um, we saw him prophesying in the city of Jerusalem. This is where he was from. That's his home. If he comes from Jerusalem, why did he go to Caesarea? What what caused this man to come to Caesarea, seek out Paul and speak with him? You just have to say, God's Holy Spirit was doing that, was calling him. An element of drama comes in. I love this. Agabus illustrates how Paul would be bound, takes, walks up to Paul, takes off his belt. Imagine? Takes off his belt. And then he ties his his legs, gets down, ties his his arms as well, and said, the owner of this belt is going to have this kind of a reception when he gets to Jerusalem. It's very powerful. Um, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle, and shall deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. Non-Jews. That's Rome. That's the Romans. Um, Very drama. Prophets often symbolize their predictions in in doing things. Um, The one that always terrorizes me is is, uh, um, Isaiah, who the Lord told him to take off his sackcloth. Well, that's all he had on. And then take off his sandals. Well, that was all he had on his feet. And Isaiah said, for three years, he ran around. You can read the passage if you wish in Isaiah. Ran around in his birthday suit to emphasize the need of the nation of Israel. Acting out these things is a part of, often is a part of the calling of the prophet. And Agabus was called to do this tie-up routine and make it very clear. Paul, you are going to go to Jerusalem. Paul, the Jews in Jerusalem are going to tie you up. Paul, 
after they tie you up, they're going to hand you over to the Romans. This is his clear prophecy. <laughs> Look at... <clears throat> so I ask you, all-powerful, all-knowing, is this another warning? Or is this another test? When you read through this chapter, you have to make a decision. What's going on? Is he standing against God's will? Or is he fulfilling God's will and willing to take whatever goes along with it? Verse 12 we read, And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him, begged him, not to go up to Jerusalem. Verse 13. Then Paul answered and said, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 14. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased. We said, The will of the Lord be done. After the people heard that prophecy, they plead with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Even Luke joined in on that plea and indicated by the use of we. But the apostle would not be deterred. He was Jerusalem bound. To the people around him, this was a warning. To Paul, this was a test. Though Luke didn't say so, apparently one reason his trip to Jerusalem was so important was that he was taking that major offering to Jerusalem to the believers. Uh, Limber Bible, look at Romans 15. He's already written about it. He's already written the book Romans, okay? And in Romans, just a few pages over, Romans 15 and verse 25. Romans 15, verse 25. But now, says Paul, I go to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Verse 27. It hath pleased them verily that their de debtors they are. Okay? They took an offering. They went into debt to take this offering. They risked their own financial security for this offering is what he's saying here. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of spiritual things, their duty also is to minister unto them in carnal or fleshly or earthly things. Very, very powerful. Oh, there's many other passages. If you want them, I'll give them to you. Paul wanted to make this presentation of the money in order to fortify one of his basic doctrines, and that is the unity of both Jewish and Gentile believers. He's yet to write the book Ephesians, but when he does, he's talking about the wall comes tumbling down between Jew and Gentile. Um, and then we see Paul's imprisonment in Judea, verse, starting with verse 15, which is the Paul's report to the Jerusalem church. Look at verse 15. And after those days, oh, I love statements like this, we took up our carriages and went to Jerusalem. And there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, and brought with them one Manasseh of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. Pause here. We took up our carriages. Listen to me. This is the fun part of studying God's Word. To every other writer of the New Testament, Every other writer of the New Testament, Greek was a second language. To Luke, it was his mother tongue. Why do I say that? In this chapter alone, Luke uses words that are found nowhere else in the New Testament but in this chapter. Not even in other chapters that he's written. Ten words that I could find are found nowhere else. And the one in front of us took up our carriages happens to be one of those. Nowhere else in the New Testament. 
He's uh, doing a vocab test on us. Um, took up our carriages is episku a sameno, which is only here in the New Testament means, I would translate it, gathered up our stuff. Uh, literally, pulled together our tackle. You know what tackle is? It's the fishing boat stuff that you put in the fishing boat, okay? Our tackle, or gear, you could say. Took up his carriages. Is, would be an easy way for him to say they made preparations. Curiously, the King James, when they translated it, they chose the word carriage. And if that wasn't cur um, difficult enough, the word carriage there means something that you carry. Carriage is baggage, perfect. It's something you carry, whereas today, carriages is something that carries you, right? So that word has taken a flip since the um, 1600s. The distance from Caesarea to Jerusalem is about 65 mile. That's two day journey if you're riding a horse. Some think the home of Manasseh was at the halfway point. That's why he's mentioned. I don't know. He mentions him. It does mention that the, that the uh, people spent with them. Um, Manasseh, it tells us a little bit about him. He's from Cyprus. Hey, so is Barnabas. Reckon he's kin to Barnabas? When we get to heaven, we can ask that question. He may be kin to Barnabas, right? Uh, Manasseh was also old. It uses a very kind word for elderly um, in this particular text. Actually, no. That comes from another word. Now, I'll be glad to share that with you. But no, Manasseh is just an old Jewish, old Jewish name. Interestingly, um, in verse 16, uh, 17, it says, When we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us to James. James, do I have to say it again? Tell me about James. You got it. James is a Scottish name, okay? He, what, there weren't any Scots in this pub. You look it up in the Greek. What's in this Greek text here? is Yaakov. That was written poorly. I'll try it again. Yaakov, which we use as Jacob. There were no Jameses. The Jameses, when you see that name, think Yaakov, uh, Jacob. Um, very important. James. Who's James? He's Yaakov ben Yosef. He is James, the son of Joseph. His brother, half-brother, is Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the head of the church of Jerusalem at this time. When his brother was on earth, he didn't believe in him. But after the resurrection from the grave, seeing his brother alive, he became a believer in Jesus Christ and later on became the lead man in the church in Jerusalem. Apparently none of the apostles were in Jerusalem at this time because um, it only mentions Yaakov as the leader there. Luke mentions Paul's report of what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry, which would include the offering gathered for the saints at Jerusalem. Obviously, Paul at this point also handed over the large offering to James, to Yaakov, in the presence of all the elders of the church. Who are these elders? These are pastors from the different churches, the different congregations within the city of Jerusalem. Verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. They said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous for the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, 
saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs, namely the Hebrew customs, Mosaic customs. When the leaders of the church of Jerusalem heard of Paul's ministry among the Gentiles, they praised God. They heard his report and they praised God. But then they point him out and says, look at this. See the great number of believers in Jerusalem. Our text says the thousands, even the modern text says the same word, thousand. And that word thousands, yes, time to clear. That word thousands in the Greek is nur riades. Muriades. Remember I told you anytime you see a Greek word and you see a U, you should, if you want to find out the English equivalent, make it into a Y, right? Okay, we'll make this into a Y and see if myriad means any, ah, a big number. There was, there was a myriad of them. That's a thousands and thousands. The word myriad in the Greek language means 10,000. Literally means 10,000. It was a specific amount. But they utilized it kind of like you utilize the word billions and zillions and zillions. You know, just lots and lots and lots of them. Um, so myriad, we never are sure they're saying 10,000 or if they are saying just bunches and bunches more than anyone can count. It appears from this particular text that he's using it the bunches way. See, brother, how many, how thousands, how, how many myriads of Jews there are which believe in Jesus Christ, and they are zealous for the law. They believe in the Messiah, and they follow the law. While he was rejoicing over Paul's report, they also apprehension about Paul's reputation. These are zealous for the law. Paul are you? Well, in verse 22 we read, What is it therefore? Oh, excuse me. Um, oh, verse 21, you caught. Um, they're saying that you're forsaking Moses' law. Verse 22. What is it therefore? The multitude must see, uh, must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We've got four men that have a vow on them. And purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walks orderly. As touching the Gentiles, which we believe, We've written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from strangled, from fornication. So Paul took them in the next day, purified himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Paul, what are you doing? Paul, you are going and you're going to pay for the, these four men who had a Nazarite vow. You're going to sacrifice lambs, take them to the altar to be sacrificed. You're going to bring both animal sacrifice and meal offering sacrifice. Paul, what are you doing? We're going to start next week with what was he thinking? And I'd like you to kind of look at this passage of Scripture throughout this week. And this is where I'm going to pick up with did Paul obey God in doing this? Is he in disobedience to God in this? Is God all-powerful? Is God all-knowing? It all plays into it. We'll pick it up then next week. Father, thank you so much for what you've done for us. 
Thank you for the joy that is ours in opening up your word into reading it together. Father, I pray that you might bless, that you might strengthen, that you might encourage each and every man here. That as we go from this place, men and women might see that we know you. That they might see you and hear you in our words, in our actions. That Christ and Christ alone would be honored and glorified. This is our prayer. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.